Hey guys, welcome back to Sports Truth, and today we are kicking off Sports Truth's third consecutive year of college football coverage on this channel. Now, for those of you new to this channel, Sports Truth with me, William Lease, if you like talking about sports from a statistical perspective, an analytical perspective, if you like diving into the numbers and talking about data science and machine learning algorithms when it comes to sports, this is your place because that's what I do. I am a professional analytics or data science just by trade, if whatever you want to call me, but that's what this channel is about. And baseball, I love you, and college basketball, I couldn't do it without you, but college football is the bedrock of this channel. It is the cornerstone, and it is the sport I love to bet on the most and talk about the most. So this place is going to be your number one stop for college football and everything college football betting and statistics related here on YouTube. I want you to find one channel that is better from a statistical perspective than mine when it comes to college football. Anyway, today in this video, we're going to be talking about week zero, week zero picks. Yes, I started a college football machine learning based model from the ground up only about three weeks ago, and I got it done in time for week zero. I didn't think it could be done. I was skeptical, but I got it done with room to spare. I had to stay up late a lot of nights. Uh, a lot of nights I didn't sleep much, but I got it done. So for those of you unaware, because I haven't really announced it to the world yet, but I use six different machine learning algorithms in my model to make predictions, and I hope that it's profitable. Now, the last four seasons, I have come out ahead. I have profited the last four college football seasons with a very simple model. This year, I'm making it very complex. Does complex mean better? I don't know. We're going to see, but that's the fun in this. Anyway, stay tuned. We're going to talk about week zero coming up. All right, you are looking live at my new homepage, williamlease.com. I know you guys may have gone there for college basketball, for baseball, but I now have the football section up, and this is the power ratings for this year's college football season, at least the preseason estimates. All 130 teams, top to bottom, with 13 different stats uh, that you can see what they mean with the stat glossary link right here. And um, now these 13 stats that I have right here on the power ratings page, uh, I did a lot of model tuning over the weekend, uh, machine learning model tuning. And these 13 stats were pretty much the most influential stats uh, in the models that determine influential, meaning determining whether a team's going to win or lose. Five offensive stats, five defensive stats, two field position stats. Uh, the pace stat really only matters for totals, but it is the most influential stat on totals, so that's why I have it in as well. And then strength of schedule as long as with pro, uh, projected records. Uh, everyone's projected record based on my preseason estimates. And so this is going to be great. So this is kind of, I want you know, I created my first college football model like in 2012, and my goal is always to be like the Ken Pomeroy of college football. Um, however, the data source I used back then stopped being free, so I kind of gave it up. But I want to give a shout out to collegefootballdata.com that has made this possible. So uh, I went from having a very simple college football model the last four seasons into this. So hopefully the more complex makes it better, but we'll see. All right, so the point of this video is to talk about week zero, because as I've done the past two years, it's always been about uh, Wednesday was always the picks day of the week. And so let's get right into that. And so usually I would use an Excel file to walk through all the games the past two years. But this year I'm going to do the same thing. But this is going to be a little bit different, a little bit more complex. I know there's a lot going on, but that's why I'm here to walk you through it. So I'm going to go through all four week zero games, and we're going to talk about it from an advanced stat perspective, at least in terms of what my machine learning metrics have come up with. Now, this is the worst game of the week, UTEP and New Mexico. Actually, it's a toss up. I think UTEP New Mexico State could be closer than UConn Fresno State. I think UConn Fresno State will be a blowout. So maybe this is the two worst teams playing against each other. These are like bottom five teams in my power ratings. We got UTEP at 127 and New Mexico State at 129. Uh, that number is also right here. I didn't need to look at that. I don't even know my own spreadsheet yet. But anyway, 
So here are the machine learning metrics that I use. I use the least squares regression. I use a K nearest neighbors model. I use a gradient boosting model, a random forest model, artificial neural network, and a support vector machine. Now those six uh, machine learning uh, models I fine tuned for spreads, totals, and money lines. So the combo, which you see right here and right here, the combo is the average of the six. So if you hear me saying it's projected to be this, it's the combo. Now, I don't know if the combo is going to be the most accurate or not. It usually hasn't been, at least in college basketball. Um, so it will probably be one of these six that are more accurate than the combo, but it's still nice to know the averages. So... Let's talk about UTEP, New Mexico State. Now, we got UTEP is a nine and a half point favorite with a total 55. And I can tell you this right now. Um, the model thinks UTEP's going to win. All, all six metrics have UTEP winning by anywhere between 1.6 points, the gradient boost model, which is the most favorable to New Mexico State, to 9.5 points, which is the most favorable to UTEP. And UTEP's win percentage is anywhere between 63.7 and 76.5. Now, UTEP is clearly the favorite here. It's not even a, a, a contest. But let's go over to the betting column. So the betting column is right here. So according to the combo, the spread play would be New Mexico State. The total play is overwhelming over. And the money line play is New Mexico State as well at plus 275. Five of the six metrics have New Mexico State ahead. Uh, the K nearest neighbors is at zero. So New Mexico State, at least according to my model, would be the play on the ASTS. Money line, um, both of them are negative, so no play there on the least squares, but all the other metrics have New Mexico State as a money line play as well. And then look at this overwhelming uh, over and under, overwhelming over play here. And here's the deal. Here's why this is a tricky projection. And this is why doing preseason projections this year in college football was tricky because teams like New Mexico State did not play last year. So it's like, how do you project? They did play, but they played against like two Division II teams. So I, I didn't use their stats. So pretty much what I did for teams like New Mexico State, UConn, I appreciate the super chat, by the way, Matt Stanberry. But what I did is I pretty much just used their preseason ratings for 2020 and just carried them over into 2021. Uh, but you still did things like baseline. So it's not the exact same preseason rating I had for 2020, but you get the idea. Um, so that's why uh, New playing New Mexico State here could be pretty risky. Yeah, uh, my model says 9.5 is you know favorable for them, especially like gradient boosting uh, 7.9 points of value. But the fact that New Mexico State didn't play last year, it's like, how much will that affect? Because essentially these teams got like a death penalty pretty much for a year, and that's going to be hard to rebound from. But I do, feel, I do feel confident about the over and under. I don't know why the total is so low. Both of these teams have poor defenses. Now, both of them have bad offenses as well. We can go over here to the stats column. So this is all of their ranks across my various stats. So UTEP has, both of these teams have bottom 10 offenses, but they also have very bad defenses as well. So it's like, what's going to give? I think the fact that their defenses are so bad and are worse than their offenses is why this, uh, my model is so favorable on this game going over. Um, but neither of these teams really do anything well. But the fact that New Mexico State's pace is at 18, at least a projected pace, uh, makes me believe this game could go pretty fast, although UTEP plays a slowdown style of ball. Now, on secondary offensive stats, uh, do these teams do anything well? Well, UTEP doesn't really uh, get tackled for loss or sacks, but that's because they play a Kansas State style of ball, uh, kind of like a triple option that's not a triple option. New Mexico State, though, they don't do anything well. They're just not a good team. So this column over here is pretty interesting. Uh, this is the output um, of my K-nearest neighbors model. Now, my K-nearest neighbors model does not use the 30 most similar matchups or 30 nearest neighbors. It uses something like the, uh, um, it's a dynamic number. So it's anywhere between like 50 and 100 nearest neighbors uh, and averages, you know, the, those results right here, which is what you get with K-nearest neighbors. But this is the top 30. Um, so... If you look at the most 30 similar matchups in the playoff era, I did not include 2020, by the way, for obvious reasons, but here's how these matchups turned out. You, the teams similar to UTEP won about 80% of the time uh, with an average margin of about 11.7, uh, which is high, 
But remember, uh, if you really want to know how this would play out in a betting perspective, just look at the KNN, the K nearest neighbors column, because that's pretty much what this is, but better. This is just a pure average. The K nearest neighbors average is a little bit more complex. Uh, it weights closer, matches a little bit more heavy, um, and it also uses more inputs. So, but this is still a good good idea. And you're probably w wondering, like, okay, um, these are two really bad teams. So why do you have good teams like Georgia and South Carolina? fingerprinted to UTEP and New Mexico State. Well, the nearest neighbors algorithm actually does not look for the teams most similar to UTEP and New Mexico State, but it looks for the matchups in the past with the most similar expectations. When I mean expectations, it's like, okay, um, if UTEP, how do I, how do I say this um, expectation wise? So, okay, I'm gonna zoom in right here to try to make, oh, this is, I forgot, this is not a touch screen monitor. But I'm gonna zoom in on this. So if UTEP's expected offensive drive efficiency is minus 0.5 and New Mexico State's defensive drive efficiency is 1.6, if you average those two together, you're gonna get, a, you're gonna get about 0.7. So that's the expectation, right? So it's looking for teams, uh, matchups in the past with the most similar expectations. I don't. I, I wish I could explain that better, but I hope you guys get the idea. But from an expectation standpoint, they're two bad defenses. You know, that's that means a lot of points could be scored, right? Because it could mean that these inept offenses are going against even worse defenses and put points on the board. So we'll see. But um, that is that. So that is UTEP and New Mexico State. As far as pl uh, official plays are concerned, we will get to that at the end, but I'm gonna go through the matchups. All right, so the next matchup I'm gonna go through is UConn and Fresno State. Now, UConn is another one of those teams like New Mexico State that did not play last year, but I don't think UConn played any games at all, not even uh, layup games against Division II teams. So right here, Fresno State's an overwhelming favorite. They're favored by 27 and a half, total of 62. Um, this is expected to be a blowout. And the model does see it that way. Average score about 42 to 21 with a 98.7 win percent for Fresno State. But however, the margin isn't quite there at 27. The best margin that Fresno State gets is 22.5 on the K nearest neighbors model, which is still five points off from the spread. So obviously, if you're looking at this, you're probably like, yeah, Fresno State is the play on the, or UConn is the play on the spread because they get the edge on all six machine learning models against the spread. So it's like, okay, but then you're running into the same problem you ran in with New Mexico State in the last game. It's like, how much did UConn taking a year off affect them? I think it's going to affect them a lot. Even though Fresno State only played, what, like eight or nine games last year, at least they played. UConn had to take the entire season off. So it's like, Will there be a lot of rust uh, with them? But it is the first game of the year, so you never know. But the, what I remember from UConn, at least in 2019, is how bad their defense was. And that is still manifested here. Defensive drive efficiency is third worst in the country, as is the DPPA. All their defensive stats outside of field position are bottom three in the country. Um, Fresno State's offense is average, you know, uh, 67. That's right in the middle. So... But Fresno State's not a great team, number 83 in my model, but UConn, uh, already a bad team before COVID year, didn't play last year, they shouldn't be good. Fresno State doesn't have a great defense though, um, number 104 on drive efficiency, and number 98 on DPPA. Um, and on secondary stats, they don't really pop on anything else either. So I think even, I think UConn, if Fresno State's defense really is uh, rank 104, they should be able to at least score 20 points. I think if they can do that, this game could go over. Uh, however, there's two metrics that have the game going under, so it's not unanimous. And then when you look at the 30 most similar matchups in the playoff era, remember this is matching expectation. Uh, New Mexico State and Georgia Southern in 2015 was the most similar, and Georgia Southern won 56 to 26. Uh, so that is right on line with the 27.5 point spread when you uh, uh, adjust for neutral. So if you notice that these columns, this is the actual score of the game. 56-26 was the actual score of that game, but N score uh, factors uh, in home advantage and neutralizes that score. So if um, so it added 1.2 points to the away team and subtracted 1.2 points from the home team for a neutralized margin of 27.7. However, the total was 82, which is way over. So if I had to bet on the total in this game, I would bet over, but it's not unanimous. So 
that is UConn and Fresno State. We will see what happens with that game. All right, now getting on to Hawaii and UCLA. All right, so Hawaii is an 18-point underdog. Uh, 68.5 is the total. Hawaii, you can get them at plus 550 on the money line. For those of you who remember the very first college football picks video I did on this channel two years ago, week zero, I picked Hawaii on the money line at like plus 330 or something like that, and they won against Arizona. Um, and if you remember the vlog video I did about it, um, I did not find out that they had won until the morning after because I camped at Mount Charleston that night with no cell service, so I had no idea of how, uh, figuring out how the matchup turned out. Um, but anyway, obviously UCLA is the better team here. Uh, projected score of about 38 to 21 with a win percentage of 88% for UCLA. Uh, margin is 17, so that's pretty much in line with the spread. Uh, average total is 59.6, which is quite below the posted total here of 68.5. The most favorable model for UCLA is the artificial neural network at 18.2, and the most favorable model for Hawaii is the gradient boost at 13.9. Um, the gradient boost actually has Hawaii winning about 31.3% of the time. I think that's a little high, but um, that is it is what it is. And then the total, the highest total is gradient boost at 64.7. The lowest total is the artificial neural network at 56.8. Now, when we look on the betting side of things, the combo slightly favors Hawaii, but in the over is pretty overwhelmingly under. And money line, neither team has an edge. They're both negative. However, more favorable towards UCLA, but I don't think I would ever play a money line that high unless I was putting it in a money line parlay. Spread uh, is split with four of the metrics going to Hawaii, but only the gradient boost in random forest uh, more than a point. Um, the two metrics that favor UCLA are pretty much dead even, so really not a lot of value on the UCLA spread. Money line, um, the only one that favors Hawaii is gradient boost, um, but I don't think that's enough. All the others favor UCLA. And then under, unanimous under uh, on all six. So I think under would be a play here. Now, can Hawaii pull the upset? I don't think so. They're number 105 in my model. Um, they have a tough situation uh, with COVID and everything, um, going to UCLA, who is improving under Chip Kelly. Uh, you know, they were horrible his first year, and they've slowly gotten better. They're not quite where they probably expected to be under Chip Kelly, but I think this is going to be their best year so far at number 37. Number 21 ranked offense and the number 36 ranked defense. The only uh, stat that main stat that Hawaii has an edge on is defensive passing down success rate. And that's where UCLA needs to get better at on offense is passing downs. They were good at running the ball, but throwing the ball has been their weakness with uh, Dorian Thompson Robinson. Is he still their quarterback? I don't know if he is, but you get the idea. Uh, and then the secondary stats, UCLA wins them as well. The most similar matchup is uh, Kentucky and Tennessee in 2015, where Tennessee won 52 to 21. Uh, so that was a 31 point win for them with a total 73, which did go over the 68.5. Uh, team similar to UCLA, remember the K nearest neighbors model is this right here, but better. But just for the sake of a uh, quick rundown, the team similar to UCLA won 80% of the time, average score of about 38 to 22 and a total of 59.6. So I think just looking at that, I, I am pretty sure the under is going to be a play. And now we're going to get to the matchup of the week. It's not a great matchup, but out of the four, it's the best one. And that is Nebraska and Illinois. Now, Nebraska comes in as a seven-point road favorite, and the total is 55.5. We got an interesting dynamic here. Scott Frost definitely on the hot seat, no doubt about it. And then we have Illinois, new coach Brett Bielema. Now, I am usually not a fan of retread hires. When I say retread hire, it means hiring a coach that had failed elsewhere. Because usually if a coach gets fired for being a failure, there's a reason for it. So if you're hiring that coach, again, that's a retread hire. They usually don't work out. But... I think that Brett Bielema failed at Arkansas mainly because he tried to bring a Big Ten style to the SEC. It just didn't work out. But I think he can at very least elevate Illinois to be a you know a, a, a solid team. Maybe not like the SEC West leader like he had Wisconsin when he was at Wisconsin, but you know good you know at least on the same level as like a Northwestern or a Purdue, uh, maybe even a Minnesota. But I, I, it's not a horrible hire. He knows the Big Ten. He knows offensive linemen. But anyway, breaking down the matchup. Um, at least from a 
score perspective, all six mod models have Nebraska winning by an average of about 29 to 24, 66% of the time for Nebraska, average margin of 4.8 and a total of 53. Um, not one of these models has Illinois uh, winning and on totals, um, anywhere between 56.4 and 51.3, and on margin, anywhere between 1.9 for Nebraska and as high as 6.8 on the random forest. Now, when we come over to the betting column, uh, against the spread, Illinois has an average value of 2.2, under has an average value of 2.5, and Illinois has an average money line value of 2.8. So all six models favor Illinois uh, against the spread all six of them uh, covering that seven point home spread. Uh, on Moneyline though, um, it's split, four metrics favor Illinois and two, uh, one metric favors Nebraska. The KNN has Nebraska highlighted, but it's negative, so no value there. And over and under, five of the six have Illinois uh, with the K nearest neighbors model favoring the over. So the under, it looks to be at least a, a look. And so we're coming over to rankings. Nebraska's the 45th ranked team in my model. Illinois at number 88. Um, Nebraska, at least coming into the game, does four of the six main offensive stats better. However, Illinois is better on passing down success rate and field position. Just like UCLA, Nebraska hasn't been too bad running the ball, but they just can't get any consistently passing the ball, especially on passing downs. So they need to improve that if Scott Frost is going to survive this season. But the real takeaway here is defense. I do think it's going to take a while to get Brett Bielema going on the defensive side of the ball, and that's where Nebraska has an edge in this game. The offenses are split, but Nebraska is a better defensive team. Number 40th ranked defense on drive efficiency, number 36 on PPA. Um, they do everything pretty decently on defense except field position, which is where Illinois has an edge. And on the secondary stats, Nebraska wins the secondary defensive stats while Illinois wins the secondary offensive stats. So if Illinois is going to win this game and not just cover, what they need to do is keep Nebraska from establishing a group passing the ball. And Illinois is going to have to be better than what the preseason ratings expect them to be on defense. Um, I think if they can do that, they might be able to win outright, but it's going to be tough. I don't see them winning, but I do think they will cover. So the most similar matchup to this one was LSU-Texas A&M in 2014, where LSU won 23-17. to That sounds about right. I could easily see like a 24-17 to type score in this game, but the team similar to Nebraska won 73.3% of the time by an average score of about 33-25, to with a total of 58 um, but remember, I'm going to keep bringing this up. The K nearest neighbors model is this, but better. It, this is just a simple average of the top 30 matchups. The K nearest neighbors model is like an average of a dynamic number of matchups and a weighted average at that, meaning it would weight LSU and Texas A&M more than it would weight Maryland and Rutgers in the overall average. So I hope you guys get that. But even then, the K nearest neighbors model is the most friendly to Nebraska in the over just to let you guys know. So those are the four matchups from a breakdown perspective. Now I'm gonna go back to my website and we're gonna talk about the all model play section. So this is the part of my website where you can see how my models are doing. And uh, you can also get the pregame uh, score projections, margin projections and total projections, win projections right here. And then what all of my models are saying uh, in terms of the plays. So. You know, if you miss this video, you don't feel like watching it, you can always come here and pretty, pretty much get the same exact information that I'm showing out. And you can also track how each of the models are doing. And then we have the official plays section. Now, these are the ones I'm actually going to be on. Now, I set the keys this week to pretty much as long as there is unanimous consent, I will be on it. Uh, we're going to need to get some games under our belt to get keys in line. Um, you're probably wondering why I didn't back test, just haven't had time. And honestly, I don't know if I want to. I think part of the fun of launching a new model is to back test it in season and live and die with all that. So anyway, official plays this week, we're gonna go with Illinois uh, plus seven, UConn plus 27.5. And then we're gonna go UTEP, New Mexico State over, Illinois, Nebraska under, and UCLA, Hawaii under. Those are gonna be the five plays this week. I'm excited to get this going. Now, the plan is to do a live stream on Saturdays during college football season this year. I won't do one this Saturday because it is my, I got two big things going on on Saturday. I got a half marathon and then it is my uh, nephew's first soccer game. And then it is my other nephew's 
third birthday, so a birthday party on Saturday. So I got a very busy Saturday this Saturday, so no live stream. There's no point anyway. Only four games going on, and all of them are crappy anyway. So, however, on uh, Thursday, September 3rd, I do plan on doing an opening night live stream as well as Saturday, September 5th, uh, opening Saturday live stream. It probably won't be all day on Saturday, but I'll probably pick like a time block to do maybe like a big matchup, a key matchup or so, and we can do like live discussions of the games going on. But I feel like the live stream format lends itself very well to uh, college sports because you got so many games going on at once, which is why I did it in college basketball on Saturdays because you had like 150 games going on on the day a lot going on. Uh, same with college football. Not as many games, but still it's exciting. So these are the official plays this week. Finally excited to get college football season started. Um, I do plan on doing like an overall season preview video, but there's a couple things I want to get done in my model and website before I do that. Hopefully I'll be able to do it maybe on Sunday or Monday, and then I'll do all my videos like this, the weekly picks videos on Wednesdays. Um, so it should be a lot of fun. Uh, this is going to be a fun football season, um, hopefully a successful one. Like I said, I got a four-year winning streak of college football profits on the line, and I'm stepping up my game in terms of the complexity of my model. I could have easily just been like, you know what, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, my old model has won four straight years, but that's not fun. You know, I like the challenge. Um, besides, uh, it was too simple, meaning I couldn't be a stat nerd with it. I could be a stat nerd with uh, this new model. So a lot, lot coming. So I'm going to look at the chat and see if there's any questions I can answer. Are you going to tease all four games by six? Oh, I remember you last year, James Lil, during these videos. You're always about which two teams should I tease, and I'd always give them to you. I, yeah, at Matt Stansberry, I actually did name my models uh, fun names at first. I had uh, the Lee Squares as a blender, even though it was a blender the past two years. The Kane Dearest Neighbors as the ATM, even though it was the ATM for the past two years. But the other models I had named different. I think the Gradient Boost was named the Booster. The Random Forest was named the Poppy Field. The Support Vector Machine was named the Foundation. And the Neural Network was named the uh, Connector. But um, HAL 900, yeah, I might do that. We'll see. Um, I, I think, you know, from... If people want to know exactly how these models work, though, naming them what they actually are means they can Wikipedia what like a random forest or a support vector machine is. Um, so that's why I decided to get away the nicknames. But you know, maybe I, maybe I'll call them the nicknames on the streams. You're gonna parlay Fresno State money line, UCLA money line, and San Jose State money line. Um, I mean, I, that probably won't lose, but I, I, I would still even say the payout with that is still gonna be pretty crappy because. Uh, Fresno State is what, minus 5,000. I imagine San Jose will be about the same. Although Southern Utah is a pretty good FCS team, if I remember correctly. Speaking of, you know, I want to see what Southern Utah is at uh, in the FCS pool, if you don't mind. Because I remember them being actually a pretty good team. Maybe that was basketball, though. I know they, I think they won the Big Sky regular season last year. Um, let me, do they have FCS rankings? on here anymore. I don't think they do. They used to have the FCS rankings on um, ESPN, but I guess they don't anymore. All right, here we go. I know Sam Houston State is one. So um, Southern Utah, okay, they're actually, I don't see them on here. Um, so maybe, so that, I would imagine San Jose State's got to be a massive favorite. I, like, I don't do FBS versus FCS games in my model. So let me see what San Jose State's money line is. I hate the website I'm about to go to, but it is what it is. Just ignore the touting stuff. I don't even think the line would be up yet. It's a F usually FCS games don't come up. Yeah, minus eighteen hundred, minus seven thousand, and minus nine hundred. Yeah, that's gonna that payout has got to be ridiculous. Line calculator. That's got to be a ridiculous payout. Um, is there anything that is not run by touts? Any of these calculators not run by touts? Oh, I don't want to visit a touting website. You know, that kind of goes against what this channel stands for. I think this one could be work. So minus 900, minus 7,000, and minus, what is San Jose like? I don't know. Let's just say the same as Fresno because it's probably going to be about the same. Okay, yeah, so you're going to get uh, one to seven odds on that parlay. Um, I don't know. You might need to add another team in there unless you like staking that much. 
Alex, a question. How do you get data in the preseason since there's so much turnover in rosters? You're, you're, well, you model it. So a lot of the work that I've done on this model to come up with these preseason projections right here is modeling. So my preseason rating system is pretty simple. It has three components. It has the baseline, which is a weighted four-year average. So I want to say the baseline average is this year where 40% went to 2020, 30% 2019, 20% 2018, and 10% 2017. That's the baseline component because, you know, a team like Alabama is always going to be good. Um, if a team like Georgia has a bad year, you know it's not going to be the norm. So the baseline is just like to establish a baseline. I think the baseline gets like 20 to 30% of the final number. And then you have the regression. The regression is based off of um, returning production, which I calculate. So the, like the percentage of tackles returning has a big influence on the changes of defensive stats. Um, and likewise, the percent of the percentage of receiving yards returning has a bigger influence on improving offense the next year than re percentage of passing yards or percentage of rushing yards returning. So you model, you run regression models based on returning production, last year's stats, and I also put recruiting in there as well. Um, average recruiting score from 24/7 sports, I think. You put that in a regression model, and it can be pretty accurate. It might lowball the high end, like Oklahoma's ODE, I can guarantee you will be higher than 1.069, but it gives a more conservative estimate. Um, and then the third component is a K nearest neighbors analysis. Uh, you know, it finds the most similar teams in the past and how those teams improved or declined the next year based on returning production, their stats the past year. Um, that's it's pretty simple. So you combine those three things together, and that's how you get the preseason estimates for every stat. Um, it's it's if you want to have a good football model, NFL or college football, you have to uh, focus a lot of your time on preseason estimates and trying to get them accurate. But it was hard this year because last year is so wonky. Um, there are some things that I had to do differently. Um, like the teams that played self-contained schedules, there wasn't a lot of non-conference games last year to. Um, you know, connect all the teams. So if I had ran my preseason rankings like I normally did, Coastal Carolina would have been at the very high, and so would have BYU, um, because Coastal Carolina uh, played exclusively a Sun Belt schedule. So, so remember Colgate in college basketball this past year, and everyone was talking about Colgate because their net ranking was like four, because there's only three teams they played all year. Um, that's because according to that three-team ecosystem, Colgate was an awesome team because they blew them out. Uh, but the, th the problem with net is that it couldn't, uh, since there's no non-conference games to connect those Patriot League teams to the rest of the NCAA, uh, you can only uh, gauge their stats based on the, that self-contained schedule, and that's why Colgate was so high. So you saw that with a lot of teams last year. So what I did is I ran two iterations of preseason estimates to try to account for that. Um, I'm trying to remember how exactly I did it. I want to say I fed. I want to say I fed the rating 2019 ratings or the 2020 preseason estimates um, back into the model on a second go round, um, and that way it could be. Uh, it, it looked a lot better because if I had ran it normally, Coastal Carolina would be top 10, BYU would be a top 10, um, you know, a lot of, and a lot of better teams would be far down because, for example, Georgia, Florida only played an SEC schedule last year. Um, they didn't play enough non-conference games to really determine that the SEC is the best league. So it hurt them. So, uh, yeah, being able to feed those 2020 preseason ratings back into the model on a second go around for the preseason estimates helped kind of normalize for that. And I feel like this is a lot better. Is a, No, I don't have that Excel spreadsheet downloadable, unfortunately, but a lot of the information you can get is available on my website. Uh, Matt Stansberry or Milkman Delivering is a savant website what you've been looking for. I like the one on MLB. Apparently there's an NFL one now. I don't think I'll make an NFL model though. It's just I, too much going on. Um, like I said, I have 
balls to the wall to get this done, and I'm, I'm ready to take a break from it, to be honest with you. Am I crazy or should I tease these games? Um, that's up to you, man. I am opposed to teasers for on principle, but I remember last year that was your thing in this chat. You were always asking advice about teasers. So if you want to, go ahead. If I were to tease, if I were to tease, it would probably be, uh, I'd probably tease the... <clears throat> I, I, I say never tease totals because the points are worth more for spreads. I would probably tease Illinois um, and probably either New Mexico State or Hawaii. Um, those are the three. Yep. If I had to. Nebraska, Illinois, under 55. Can I still take it? I don't know. Does your book still have it? Um, I think the under is safe at 55, um, unanimous. Let me come back over here. So the under, I mean, none of these will change with a half point. I say if it gets down to 54, um, I might worry, but uh, right now you should be fine at 55. Right, Milkman, you're preaching to the choir here. A daily fantasy site that focuses on defense. I would sign up for that in a heartbeat. Penn State versus Wisconsin. Wow. When, oh, yeah, that's a week one game. Am I right? I want to say that's a week one game. Now, I'm going to say this. I am not a big fan of the Big Ten opening their season with non conference games. I'm not. Um, like, usually they'll do, like, one game a year. Like, I remember Purdue and Northwestern opened the season a couple years ago. Um, I remember Ohio State and Indiana opened up the season back in 2017, which is, you know, I don't mind one game, but I think they're doing like every Big Ten team uh, is opening the season. Let me make sure. Um, I, you know, I could run my projections for Penn State, Wisconsin, but I'm not going to. I'm going to do week one picks next week. Um, but what do I think about it uh, from a perspective? Here, let me come here. What do I think about it from a perspective, like just off the top of my head? Um, well, let's look at what the numbers say. Well, we got Wisconsin at number six and Penn State at number 26. And where is the game being played? It's being played in at Wisconsin. So honestly, I would have to say... Wisconsin uh, will be they're they're projected to go 12 and 0 in my projections. I mean, looking at their schedule, I mean, they don't have really any hard road games. Their road schedule is a joke. Their hardest road game is probably Minnesota. That is terrible. Um, a lot this is a very favorable schedule. Uh, a neutral site game against Notre Dame. Uh, at Soldier Field, uh, but Wisconsin's a little bit higher than Notre Dame in my projection, so 12-0 sounds about right based on that schedule. Uh, Penn State projected to go 8-3, and three, um, but let's see. Wisconsin, is there anything that Penn State does better than Wisconsin? Well, offensively, they're better. So Wisconsin's all about defense. The number one defensive drive efficiency team in my system. Penn State's defense is uh, slightly above average, but not elite like, like Wisconsin's. Penn State has a better offense, though, uh, but Wisconsin also has a better field position numbers. Right, so, yeah, um, I would give the edge to Wisconsin um, in that game, just off the top of my head. Um, there's really no way to translate these ratings into, like, a line. Uh, but if I had to guess, it's going to be Wisconsin minus 7 or so, if I had to guess. Matt Stansberry, how does evaluating teams and expectations based on similar teams or whatnot differ from the other trends that also can mathematic, form mathematical relationships? Well, what I, I think what you're saying, this 30 most similar matchups thing, I have been doing this for a long time. It's called a K nearest neighbors model, and it's what the ATM has been in the past. If you remember um, my uh, college football model last year and in 2019, as well as my, I think I even still called it the ATM in my college basketball model. Uh, yes, I did, the ATM. K nearest neighbors, it's a machine learning model where you say, give me the, 
n nearest neighbors. So like, give me the 20 nearest neighbors, and then it tries to classify um, based off that. But what I do is I just take the nearest neighbors, um, I ignore the classification part, and then I take those t you know nearest neighbors and run you know like a, a weighted average based on that based on the Euclidean distance. Uh, that's how I calculate the weights. Um, Euclidean distance, also known as like the match rate. So if the Euclidean distance is a 0 0.025, then the match rate is 97.5, meaning there's 97.5% similarity. Um, but it's a, it's a machine learning metric, and I think it's a good way to, uh, at least a good thing to throw into a model. Um, and it's not that hard to, to train a K nearest neighbors model, uh, especially in R, which is what I do. I mean, I've been using it for years. It's a tried and true. Um, and, and I like it. And uh, if and remember the K nearest neighbors approach. Um, why is my? I hope my computer didn't just freeze. Uh, okay, there we go. Um, Anyway, the K nearest neighbors approach is has been the cornerstone of my college football model the past four years that has profited. So that's why I'm bringing it back. It's a good it's a good approach, uh, but it's a little bit more complex than this right here because all this th these numbers down here these averages are just a simple average of the thirty. But my case nearest neighbors approach usually the average number of matchups it considers is uh, anywhere between fifty and hundred, and it does a weighted average. All right, Craig Smale. I got Fresno State at minus 3,800 with UCLA minus 900, Ohio State minus 510 against Rutgers, minus 510, NC State minus 9. Who's, I'm going to have to see who these teams are playing. I know Ohio State's playing Minnesota on the road. Um, I know UCLA's playing Hawaii. I know Fresno State's playing UConn. Rutgers, I forgot who they're playing. I don't even think they're opening with a Big Ten team. Okay, they're playing Temple at home. Uh, that's the... Uh, I don't know, man. Um, and then we got NC State. They're probably playing a body bag team as well, probably a Sunbelt team or maybe in an FCS team. Um, South Florida. All right. Um, so I think all those teams should probably win except Rutgers. I, I think Rutgers will beat Temple. Um, I don't think Temple is very good. Let's look at the rankings. So we got... Rutgers at where are Rutgers at seventy five, so they're definitely improving. And I know Temple is pretty far down. Yeah, number one nineteen uh, projected to go one and eleven. Um, Rutgers projected to go four and eight. Uh, but I mean, Rutgers are they favored to beat Temple? Yes, but I don't know if I'd lay five ten uh, against them unless you're putting all those teams in a money line parlay. Uh, a thousand to pay eighteen hundred. Uh, I think those are pretty good odds to be honest. With you like I said, the only one I would sweat out in that bunch would be at, uh, Rutgers. I think all the other ones are safe. Um, like who is NC State? Where are they in my rankings? Number thirty nine, and they're playing uh, South Florida, who's also very bad. Uh, yeah, projected to go one eleven at number one ten. Yep. So I mean. Yeah, I, I think I, I think the only one I'd sweat out, like I said, would be Rutgers. Yeah, that Illinois game, like I said, I'm going to be on Illinois spread and the under, but we'll see. Uh, Nebraska might want to make a statement. Illinois might not be ready yet, but like I said, those opening games, especially on week zero, usually tend to favor the uh, team getting points um, from what I've seen week zero. Do you think defenses take longer to adjust at the beginning of the season or offenses? My guess would be defenses. Um, that's a great question, actually, because I speak of this uh, from being a former player at TCU, is that our spring practices, our spring scrimmages, our spring game, and our scrimmages in the fall, the defense has always dominated the offense, always. Um, it depends. Uh, I think defense is easier to e defenses are easier to get 
uh, performing at a high level because it's reactionary. And as long as you're, you stick to your assignments, you should be fine. But offenses, especially modern day offenses, are all about timing, execution, cohesion, um, playing well as a unit. And that can take a lot longer to get up and going, especially if you have a new offensive line or a new quarterback or a new set of receivers. Um, so I'm definitely going to answer offense with that because at TCU, that was definitely the case. Usually our offense uh, didn't really get going until the second half of the year, and we were always a second-half team. Uh, and we relied on our defense at the beginning of the year to get, get it done, but definitely offense. Will I be doing a video on tuning these models? I actually thought about it. I actually thought about doing like a live stream of the tuning, but it's such a uh, slow and tedious process that there would be a lot of dead time, just like sitting there waiting for the computer to tune the model and then like I said it's like a very tedious process because you you run the model uh, you run the uh, whatever the the test sets against the train sets and calculate the you know prediction rate or accuracy rate and then you chain like change like one tiny feature and then you run it again uh, and like some of the models take a while to tune like the random forests and the neural networks take a while like the the Least squares regressions are instant. Those don't really take a lot of tuning. Uh, I, or they, you, you tune them by adding and dropping features based on p-values. Um, but it, those, those go right away. But the others, uh, they take some time. I think it would just make for a boring content. But I could maybe do a video one day on the concepts of tuning models. How did I rank Penn State? I have them at 26. Uh, yeah, 26. How are you doing, Jay Buck? Uh, you, did you miss the talk about Illinois, Nebraska? Um, I think Nebraska is going to win, but probably by less than a touchdown, and I have it going under. Interesting matchup, you know. Scott Frost firmly on the hot seat. Things have not gone according to plan since he got there. Uh, Illinois, re, you know, I don't know if they ever hit rock bottom under Lovey Smith, but um, they weren't great. I think. You know, like I said, I, I'm not a big fan of retread hires. However, I'll make an exception for Brett Bielma. I think he can make things. I don't know if he'll have Illinois playing at an elite level like he had Wisconsin when he was there, but I think he can have them at least at the level of like a Northwestern or a Purdue, um, you know, a team that goes like eight and four, seven and five, six, you know, at least makes a bowl game every year. The Big Ten West is getting better. It, it really is. Although um, we'll see what Purdue can do. Um, I'm still not convinced. Uh, about their program. South Carolina 1 and 10, I think you're correct. Yeah, South Carolina fans, I know some, they're not optimistic at all. Yeah, I have them at 101 going 1 and 11. The South Carolina fans I know would probably say, you know what, I'm not surprised that sounds about right. Um, because, yeah, I'm not, first of all, I don't think they made a good hire. I'm not a, I'm not a believer in Shane Beamer. I don't think he's going to do what needs to be done. And then looking at their schedule, I mean, where are the wins going to come from? Yeah, they'll be Eastern Illinois. Should they be favored against East Carolina? Yes, they're 101 and 102, my model. Um, they, sh I mean, that, that's a toss up. But where are the wins going to come from? Where are the wins going to come from? They're not going to beat Georgia on the road. They're not going to be A&M on the road, right? We're, they're not going to beat Clemson. So uh, Troy, Vanderbilt, where are those teams sitting? Here's Troy. Troy's ranked higher than them. Vanderbilt, where are they at? Okay, 106. I'm, I, I'm surprised at um, 1 and 10. So I'm guessing their one win, according to my model, is Vanderbilt, um, even though they're higher than East Carolina. You know what? I think this projected record uh, column might not be 100% accurate because I think there is a step I forgot to do. Um, I used the least squares regression, by the way, but I think I forgot to, um, I, I think I need to redo it because there's some things, there's one step I forgot to do in making these projections. Um, I'll, I'll redo it. I'll have it done by the time I have the team pages up. But I would, if I, going through South Carolina's schedule, they're going to beat Eastern Illinois. I think they'll beat East Carolina. So they'll be 2-0. Oh. They're going to lose to Georgia, 2-1. Oh. They're going to, I think they'll lose to Kentucky, 2-2. Two two. Uh, Troy is going to be a tough uh, out in the Sun Belt, uh, but let's give it to them. Three and two, lose to Tennessee. Three and three, beat Vanderbilt. Four and three, four and four, four and five, four and six, um, four and seven. So the Auburn game won't matter. I think their ceiling is five wins. Five wins is their ceiling. 
But South Carolina fans aren't optimistic. I don't think they made a good hire. But I think 1 in 10 might be a bit too pessimistic. But like I said, I think um, those projections aren't 100% accurate based on uh, some things I forgot to do. Arizona 0-12. Um, I think that's realistic. Um, Arizona dumpster fire. I don't even know who they hired. Who do they hire as their coach? Arizona. Whoops. Let's talk about Arizona. Yeah. I mean, I plan on doing a separate college football preview video, but, um, you know, this is fun. Why not, you know? Arizona. I mean, opening the season at BYU. Okay, Jed Fish. I don't even know who that is. Who is Jed Fish? Okay, so he was an interim coach at UCLA four years ago. I don't know who that is. But uh, anyway, BYU, let's look at their schedule. BYU, I think they'll lose that game. Uh, San Diego State, they're probably going to lose that game. Northern Arizona, they'll probably win that. Uh, Oregon lost, so that's one and three. UCLA, let's skip that. At Colorado, loss. Yeah, I, I, I see a ceiling of three wins for Arizona. I do. A ceiling. Do I ever think that sometimes this is overanalyzing? Yeah, it can be. Uh, you don't have to go this deep. Like I said, the model I used the past four seasons that won me money every year was very simple. Like, like, minimal effort. Very simple. If I told you guys what it was, you guys would be like, oh man, that really is simple. Uh, but uh, I, I do this more for the being a stat nerd. I, I enjoy more like the statistical analysis than the betting. And so that's why I do this. It's more like for to enjoy just the stats rather than the bet with. But you know, it's fun to use it to bet as well, just to see how accurate you are. But is it overanalyzing? Maybe, but we'll wait and see. If this model ends up losing money on the year, it probably is overanalyzing because the simpler approach I used the past four years was better. Are my ODE and DDE based on projections or historical data? It is projections. These are all preseason projections, based modeled projections, based on returning production, recruiting baseline, and other things. prefer videos on each type of model and then use seeing that work in action. Yeah, I could see that being the case. Maybe doing like a, a showcase or a spotlight. You know, here's the least squares regression. Here's how I do it. Here's how it works. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, I, I'm pretty transparent about the approaches that I use in my model. Uh, the these These different types of machine learning techniques, but you know, I'm, I don't think I'm giving away my model by saying what those are because it still takes a lot of preparation to get the data and a lot of tuning, um, a lot of data wrangling and all that to get to the point where you can deploy a model like that and get predictions out of it. Um, it takes a lot of work. So if you're willing to put into the work to prepare a data set for, uh, to be uh, fed to a model, uh, all the power to you, all the power to you because it takes, it takes work to do that. Under in the New Mexico State game, absolutely not. That's the biggest mismatch of the week, according to my model. Look at that. I need to go back into MySQL and change, because I guarantee these are all more than 10. I think it's just that um, the limit was reached. I need to raise the limit on the edge values in MySQL. Yeah, I can see Arizona winning a couple, but I think their ceiling is three. How often do you need to tweak your models? Um, whenever you feel like it, to be honest with you. If you're not satisfied with what it's doing, you go back to the drawing board. Um, I don't know if you go completely scrap it and start from nothing, but you, um, you, know, you might change the tuning parameters a little bit or change some of the features or take a feature out. Um, feature selection is a big part of this. Um, I don't feed all of these variables into all my models, right? I want to say... My K nearest neighbors model only uses five stats, five. Because in K nearest neighbors, the fewer features you have, the better. Because the more features you add, the, the harder it is to find neighbors that are similar. Um, so my K nearest neighbors, I only have five. I'm not going to tell you what they are, because that's where I'll protect the model. I'll say what the approach I use for the model is, but not the features. Um, but some of my models use a lot of features. I want to say the support vector machine model uses not just all of these, but also many of the secondary stats as well. So 
yeah, it's a, it's a lot of fun. Three to four wins for South Carolina sounds about right. I think their ceiling is five. Don't get me wrong, I build models myself, but I feel like it's only one piece in the selection process. You're probably right. I mean, I'm not hating on people who don't use models. That's just the approach I choose to use. If you want to use models to help guide you but not make your decisions, that's, that's fine. That's, that's nothing wrong with that at all. Yeah, uh, my um, projected records does not count FCS games. Most memorable game that you bet on in the past three years? That's a great question. Man. I can probably... You know, you usually remember your bad losses more than your amazing wins. Like, I can rattle off my bad losses. Um, all right. One that comes to mind is two weeks in a row in 2019, I lost spread bets on onside kicks that were returned for a touchdown. Like, if the team had just fallen on the onside kick and the game would be over, they'd kneel the clock, the game's over, and I win my bet. But instead, the team did not fall on the onside kick. Instead, they picked the ball up and run for a touchdown. It happened to me two weeks in a row. Two weeks in a row. UNLV and Boise State was the first one, and the second one was like Middle Tennessee and Louisiana Tech, or Louisiana Tech and Florida Atlantic. I know Louisiana Tech was involved, but I was like, the odds of an onside kick being returned for a touchdown, that's like a once-in-a-season occurrence. And not only did it happen twice, two weeks in a row, but it happened two weeks in a row on games I bet on, and two weeks in a row games I bet on where I was on the losing side. And I want to say both of the... Uh, I know the UNLV-Boise State game was like a late, like... Late, I remember that game ended after midnight Pacific time. Uh, but the Louisiana Tech Florida Atlantic game, or whatever Florida International, whoever was a Thursday night game. Um, so it happened in a span of like five days, yeah. But you know, like I said, if, if one loss makes you like you know, it sucked, I'm not saying I was like celebrating that, but like if you practice good bankroll management, that one loss isn't going to make or break you because for every bad beat you have, you're going to have a good beat. But as far as like good wins, I know in 2019. Week one, I was at the Red Rock, and I had Stanford. I want to say I had him at, like, minus six against Northwestern. And Stanford was up by three, and there was under a minute to go. Like, Northwestern was, you know, garbage possession. They're down by um, – or no, it wasn't a garbage possession, but like there was like 30 seconds left and Northwestern had to like march the entire field to kick a field goal to tie. Probably wasn't going to happen, but the only way I could cover this was if Stanford got like a turnover and return it for a touchdown. That's exactly what happened. Like 20 seconds left, Northwestern fumbles the ball, Stanford picks it up and scores a touchdown and I cover. Like that was pretty memorable because it was at the Red Rock and a lot of people reacted to that in good or bad. Some people had Northwestern, some had Stanford, but it was, and like, I want to say like maybe a minute later um, in the Auburn-Oregon game, I had Auburn minus two and a half, I think, and they were losing. But they, on I want to say on like fourth and long, they, had, they got a 39-yard touchdown with like 10 seconds left. And uh, not only won, but they covered as well. That, was, that, that and the Stanford-Northwestern game happened in like a five-minute span. That was pretty memorable. How are you doing, Abar 0907? Uh, K nearest neighbors, Michael L. K nearest neighbors is just like a, it's a machine learning model that like you have a data set and you're trying to find like, for example, if I was running a K nearest neighbors here, like, and I put Alabama, what are the teams most similar to Alabama? So I would like, you know, according to these stats, like say, you know, I use offensive drive efficiency, defensive drive efficiency, pace, and OPPA and DPPA, say those are my five. So what are the most similar teams to Alabama based on those five stats? And it would come up with a list. And K nearest neighbors, um, if I did uh, K equals five, it would find the five most similar teams. So Ian Money, you remember that LA Tech return? Yeah. Yeah, like I said, you definitely remember the losses more than the wins. Um, 
I know in 2012, like back when I was doing dumb bets like parlays and stuff, I had a eight team parlay. Yeah, I know, right? I had like 10 bucks on it to win 1400 something ridiculous. And the first seven teams won. The first seven teams won. And the only one I had left was Georgia Tech. I'm going to pull this up because I forgot what the line was. But I know it, it lost. You, you, I wouldn't bring it up if it won. But um, it was 2012, Georgia Tech at home against Miami. And I want to say Georgia Tech was maybe like a pick 'em or like maybe a minus two or a minus three. Either way, they are looking good for most of the game. Like, I was like, yeah, I have this in the bag. It was on a Saturday in September of 2012. Um, I want to say September 22nd was the exact date, maybe September 15th. I know they played Miami. I can't tell you that. It was September 22nd. They were playing Miami at home, and they were like, I want to say like a two- or three-point favorite. And, yeah, uh, with um, 10 minutes ago in the third quarter, they are up by 17, right? And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to win this 18 parlay and win 1400 bucks. Uh, Miami comes back. Miami comes back, right? They tied the game with 27 seconds to go, but what Georgia Tech tried to do, um, I want to say there was like maybe a minute left and Georgia Tech was up by seven and they were facing fourth and inches. Uh, and Georgia Tech decided instead of punting the ball, giving Miami the ball back, they're going to go for it and end the game, right? And so Georgia Tech with their triple option offense, right, um, they get stuffed. Doesn't work. Uh, Miami gets the ball back with only like a minute left. Uh, march downfield, they score a touchdown, tie the game. We're going to overtime, right? And the same scenario happens in overtime. Instead of kicking a field goal on fourth and inches in overtime, Georgia Tech decides to go for it. They get stuffed again. And now Miami only has to kick a field goal to win the game because Georgia Tech had the ball first. But instead, Miami scores a 25-yard touchdown on the first play of overtime. I lose the bet. I lose the parlay. That was a tough one. I remember that one very well. Anyway. Yeah, Ian Money remembers my Kansas State money line hit last year. I, I did hit it plus 1,400. Um, that wasn't my biggest money line hit ever, but it was definitely my biggest one in the past five years. I want to say I hit a bigger one on Texas State in 2012, I think. Uh, they were playing Houston. Um, it was a big hit, too. It was, in the, it was definitely in the two or 3,000 range. Um, but I only the thing is I only had like five bucks on it or something like that, but it was a long shot, you know. But, um, yeah. Why use offensive and defensive stats rather than points for and points again, both adjusted since they are the ultimate proxy for both offense and defenses? Um, you know, that's a good question. I did come up with a mo my first college football model ever was adjusted points for and points against. It was. That was the core of it. Um, I just feel like drive efficiency is a little bit better because it can take into effect start uh, field position, um, starting field position and all of that. Uh, field position is a big deal. It really is. Um, but you're right. Um, adjusted points for and points against can be a good predictor in its own right, but I feel like it might be a bit too broad, um, maybe not enough detail, and that's the ultimate issue with it. I feel like you can get a bit more granular to gain that edge with drive efficiency and PPA. Yeah, um, there was a win I had, a bar 0907, where I covered a seven and a half point spread in overtime because of that, because it went to triple overtime and the team won by eight. Um, I also covered a game in overtime once because the team ran back an interception for a touchdown. Um, and that was like a four point spread. Uh, so that was good. Should beginners learn Python, machine learning, or both? Um, well, actually, you use, you use Python or you use R to do machine learning. So you're going to have to learn Python or R to learn machine learning. Um, to be honest with you, I prefer R. I'm an R guy myself. I program this college football model in R. But I think Python might be a little bit easier to learn uh, if you don't know either R or Python already. And Python's also a little bit more widely used, so it's easier to find support and help and Google stuff for Python. Um, 
but the reason I prefer R is because I just like the data frames matrices uh, better because they're built into R. You don't have to use a separate package like pandas to get those uh, functionality because those features are built into R. R is better for statistics. Python is better for general use. That's what people always say, and that's, that's accurate. But you can use both. Um, I do think it's a little bit easier to... I think using the machine learning algorithms and packages in R are easier to use than sklearn in Python. Uh, I really do. Um, so those are just the pros and cons. Like points, form points again are the ultimate proxy because that's the ultimate measure of success in football. But points don't tell the whole story. Um, unlike other sports. So, I mean, actually, you know, like, for example, in baseball, runs are the end-all, be-all, but, you know, a team that gets 15 hits and scores two runs against a team that scores three runs on one hit, you know, it's like, there's, there's a lot of different stats in football that can help explain success uh, as well. But I just feel like drive efficiency is a better way of measuring a team's offensive uh, and defensive capabilities and points for and points against because it's against expectation. Yeah, I remember, like, you know, at parlays, I remember, that because, you know, that was back, like, almost 10 years ago. You didn't, I didn't hedge out to the first seven wins. No, because a lot of these... Um, I want to say, like, three of the games happened before Saturday, uh, and then the five, the other five are like on Saturday morning and afternoon. So they kind of all happen together. Uh, and um, so I think I went into the Georgia Tech game with that being like only one, that game and one other game left. So you couldn't really hedge. Now that I'm back in Texas, will I add to the model uh, and adjust player stats for DFS. Um, if I were to do that, it would definitely be a project I do later in the season. Like I said, I've really gone balls to the wall to get this done. I'm ready to take a break, to be honest with you, from all this, because it's been so much work um, to get this ready for this season. Um, and, you know, I started my new job. Um, you know, I, ha I have things going on. I can't dedicate all my free time. Like, I pretty much spent all my free time in the past two weeks doing this. Time that I haven't been working, sleeping, or working out has been this. And, you know, I've neglected a lot of things to get this done. You know, I, ha I got, like, a coffee table from Living Spaces that I still haven't put together, and it's been in the box for, like, the last two weeks. I, like, let dishes pile up in the sink. You know, I feel like I'm letting myself go almost to get this done. But, um, no, I, I, if, I, if I were to make a daily fantasy model for college football, it would definitely be something I probably wouldn't do until um, at least uh, late September, early October at the earliest, if I do it at all. We'll see. We'll see. It depends on if I, how, how badly I want to do it. Um, but, like, like I said, once I get... There's still a couple things left I want to do. I need to get, I want to get individual team pages for the website, um, you know, and I need to get the model, you know, the, the nuances that you need to do after you actually get actual games to plug in, um, get everything running smoothly, uh, and yeah, maybe a project in October. We'll see. What do I think about the esports market? It's a pretty small market with great inefficiencies. First month got 6% yield on pretty high volume. I mean, the, I, I haven't looked into it, to be honest with you. I have not looked into betting on esports before. Um, the, the challenge that I have, uh, you just need to have a self contained data set. Um, as long as you can, you know, as long as you feel like you have an approach that gives you an edge whether that be a model or not, then I say go at it. Um, but I can't see why there's inefficiencies in it because if there's not like a, like if there's not like a league or whatever that these esports guys play into where you can like measure their success and failure and everything, like you're basically just going off gut. And if the odds makers are going off gut, then that can be exploited. So that's how I see it. Texas or OU this year? Um, yeah. It's going to be OU. They're going to be hard to beat. It pays me to say that 
as a TCU fan, but uh, they, yeah, they're going to be a hard out. Uh, let's look at their schedule. They're, I think they'll beat Texas, but I mean, their, ske- their schedule, I mean, they get Iowa State at home. They get Texas at a neutral site. So, like, do they have any hard road games? That's the question. At Tulane, that's not a hard road game. So, like, their hardest road game is probably Bedlam at the end of the year. I mean, they just have a very favorable schedule. Like, the teams expected to challenge them are Iowa State, Texas, um, and then this, the Tier 2 teams, TCU and Oklahoma State. I mean, three of those four teams, are they're not having to play it on the road for. So, yeah, I, I would be... I say this every year, and, like, I was shocked that they lost to K-State last year. Thank you, by the way, E. Hodge. I was shocked that they lost to Iowa State in 2017. Every year, Oklahoma loses a game they shouldn't. They've lost to K-State the last two years, for example. Will that happen again this year? The odds probably say yes. There's, if the odds of them losing a game are probably higher than the odds of them going undefeated. But I, I just don't know where the loss is going to come from. I don't. Just looking at the schedule. So, yeah. They they probably have as good of a chance as anybody else to go undefeated this year. Do I rate defensive drive efficiency? What do you mean by rate? Yes, I have it. Defensive drive efficiency. Number one, Wisconsin. Number two, Clemson. Number three, Alabama. Number four, Texas A&M. Number five is Cincinnati. Those are the top five. Yeah, I, I you know, football season's coming in, and I feel like channels like mine, the analytics don't lie. My channel gets more views, more subscribers, more ad revenue during football season. And uh, that's why I work so hard to get this model done in time for college football season, because I know that's when my views are up, my subscribers are up, all that, and that's that's um that's that's why this chat's more active than my baseball ones. My college basketball ones got pretty active, but um especially like later in the year, but you know, college football is what it is. Do I plan on doing something like this for NFL? No. Uh yeah, I don't bet on NFL. I don't have a model for NFL, so what would I talk about? I could, you know, DFS maybe, I don't know. But um Sunday I need to have an off day at least some point of the week. Should start a Discord or Slack channel. I've thought about starting a locals page, to be honest with you. I have. Have I considered using PFF player ratings in any way? I had good success using them, but I stuck with your Power 5 plus American matchups only. Well, the thing for, um, are you talking about pro football focus uh, player ratings? Um, The thing is my model is not individual based unlike my college basketball and MLB models, which are individual-based. These are all team-based, so I don't know where exactly I'd plug those in. I already use recruiting uh, for preseason estimates, so I feel like that might give you a good proxy, but pro football focus, um, that's a good, you brought up a good point, but you know, it's like, how I'm still trying to figure out how I'd plug that in. Because I know, like, TCU, for example, I know this just because that's where I went, and I'm a fan, but I know they have, like, the number two cornerback, and they had the number one safety in college football last year. I mean, how much does one player impact things? So you need, like, a composite of all the players for that team uh, for it to be helpful. So that's that's kind of how I see it. <laughs> Only fans, no way. Nope, not gonna happen. But yeah, I've thought about starting a locals page, but we'll see. I'm, I we'll see. I feel like YouTube is good for now. Um, let's see. Uh, do I have anything else? Oh, it's been over an hour. Yeah, things go so fast when you enjoy what you're talking about. Team ratings as well as individual player ratings. It doesn't adjust well for SOS, but yeah, you could do that on the back end though. You could adjust for SOS on the back end. I'll have to look into that. I mean, I, it probably won't be an addition to this year's model, but maybe uh, for if, uh, maybe if the model gets off to a bad start and I'm looking for something, uh, maybe. Yeah, more suited, more suited for DFS. Yeah, it would definitely would be. And the thing with college football DFS is it's 
quarterbacks, running backs, and wide receivers only. No other positions. And I've thought about how to do a daily fantasy model for CFB. I've definitely thought about it. I think what I would do is like estimate the expected passing yards, rushing yards, and receiving yards for each team, uh, and then just pick their quarterback, running back, and maybe their top receivers based on those estimates. I mean, I don't know how else you would do it. Appreciate it, Bill Reddick. All right, well, it's been uh, an hour and 15 minutes, so I feel like that is a good time to call it a day. Like I said, I plan on doing like a generic college football preview video maybe on Sunday or Monday. Uh, I want to get the individual team pages up, which shouldn't take long because it's just, I mean, it's the same template I use for college basketball, which, I, which I'll show you what I'm talking about. So like this, I want to build this out, but for college football, and it won't take long, especially because I don't have individual stats yet. I don't know if I'll add them in. Uh, if I do, it will, like I said, it'll be a project for later in the season. Uh, but it'll at least have the schedule, projections, and stats. So um, yeah, uh, team by team game log. Yeah, I don't know if I'll do. I don't know if I'll go this far. Like I said, I'm so burned out on getting this. Uh, football model done in time for the season that I just want to take like a break for <laughs> like a month or so before doing anything new. So I'll put in team pages, but apart from that, I don't know. Uh, yeah. So like I said, uh, like a generic college football season preview video on Sunday or Monday, probably. Uh, and then week one picks will come Wednesday. And I'm thinking about on Sundays during the season to do like a post-mortem meaning like I go over the, I did these videos two years ago where I did like a recap, um, but like a post-mortem where I talk about like how I did and talk about the games from the night before, uh, maybe a quick look ahead, but picks videos definitely on Wednesday and maybe a post-mortem on Sunday and then a live stream on Saturday. That's, that's probably going to be the schedule and maybe uh, uh, a free-for-all on like Thursday or Tuesday because there's things I want to talk about uh, that aren't related to like direct statistics and everything. Like I want to talk about my thoughts on NIL. I want to talk about my thoughts on realignment, which I already have, but continue to talk about that. I want to talk about like the playoff. You know, there's things I want to talk about like that aren't related to stats. So maybe like a free for all. All right, what I majored in at TCU, I majored in uh, media analytics. Yep. Construct our own rating system to see how what is played in the lineup affects dry, but yeah, great. Good ideas here. All right. Good luck, Ryan C. Yeah, I appreciate everybody for tuning in. I really do. Like I said, this is going to be your place for college football this season, so don't go anywhere. We're going to have a fun season right here on Sports Truth with me. So uh, like I said, I'll be back uh, uh, hopefully Sunday or Monday with a generic season preview where I have the team pages up and we can talk about individual teams in depth. Anyway, this is uh, Sports Truth with me, William Lee, signing off. <laughs>